Okay, so like the club hasn't even moved yet, right? And so he's kind of setting up to it. He lifts that front foot. Um, so that's you know, obviously he's 100% into his trail foot there. And then he stomps the front foot and lifts his trail foot. And so now he's 100% into his lead foot. And then the second that trail foot hits the ground, he takes the club away. And so to me, that, that stomping is a pre-trigger for some horizontal motion or some horizontal force, right? So he's trying to create that side-to-side -side force, that swaying force, basically. Hey guys, thanks for watching. Really exciting video today. We're going to be talking about the ground forces in golf, going over some of the data, letting you understand what's happening against the ground, and whether or not that matters in creating more speed. We're going to go a little bit into some deep analysis with Dr. Scott K. Lynn, who is one of the foremost experts in ground reaction force in the golf swing in the world. And then we're also going to go a little deeper into, okay, that's cool that that's happening, but what can we do to start thinking about how to increase our speed and also increase our pattern as, as far as uh, flushing it out of the center more often. So let me welcome Dr. Scott to the show. Hey, doctor, how are you? Doc, uh, Dr. Scott's been going all over the world lecturing uh, or uh, giving presentations about this. He works with Swing Catalyst, which is the best um, device to measure all the forces in the golf swing. So tell us, uh, uh, we're going to be talking mainly in this video about the guy who just won the World Long Drive Championship, Kyle Berkshire. So uh, have you, I know the answer, but have you gotten to measure Kyle? Yeah, fortunately enough, um, one of our ambassadors, Bernie Najar, who is based out of Caves Valley in uh, Baltimore, just outside Baltimore, Maryland, um, has worked with him since he was a little kid. So it was two years ago, I believe, at the PGA show, he brought him by our booth, um, and we actually got a chance to measure what it was that he was doing. And um, Unfortunately, his swing has evolved a little bit in the last two years, but I think um, based on what I saw two years ago, I think there's there's a reason why he's doing what he's doing now and why he's producing a lot more speed, hitting a lot more a lot further, and, and now actually you know winning those events. So. Do you remember or did you see what the club head speed or ball speed number was back then for Kyle? Um, I have it here, yeah. it's uh, And the problem was that he didn't go through his full warm-up because um, he just kind of came in off the street and we're like, hey, hit some for us. So, and I know those guys, in order to do that, that crazy athletic move that they do, they have a full warm-up that they go through. So I don't think he didn't do that. And plus you're indoors, so there's a little... There's a little governor on what he's trying to do because, um, you know, you're in this booth and it was actually pretty funny. Right behind our booth was a hot dog vendor. I don't know if you've ever been to the PGA show in Orlando. Yeah. This guy was selling hot dogs right behind our booth and we had just set up this screen like hours before he got there. And uh, and just before that, I think it was Sadlowski went to the Golf Channel and ripped a ball right through the screen. So we were so afraid we we're going to kill this hot dog vendor when he started ripping right. those things in there. But um, his ball speed was, I think it was 193 on... Uh, Mm -hmm. which I don't know what his winning drives were. They were probably 223, I think, was the winning one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, so clearly this wasn't him, um, you know, at his full potential. But, I mean, I think, you know, probably at the time, two years ago, this was probably, you know, a pretty decent swing for him. I mean, I'm, I'm sure he was over 200 in competition, but he definitely wasn't 223, that's for sure. Right. Yeah, one of the things that, uh, you know, they're trying to get, every little ounce and every little fraction of a mile an hour more. And one of the things that he said was really big for him this year, as we saw on the sidelines, him like hitting so many balls, like in between. And he said that him and his coach figured out that he's at peak performance between like 170 and 190 beats per minute on, uh, in, in his heart rate. Yeah. And uh, that was a really big uh, difference maker for him as far as, and just like you said, like walking off the street, and then actually, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised to see, like we see in the uh, NFL, and see uh, exercise bikes on the sideline, you know, just to keep yourself loose and keep yourself warm. Totally, yeah. And I mean, it's an incredible athletic feat what these guys are doing. And so um, to get your body ready to do that kind of thing. And, and you know, everybody's different. Everybody's going to need to get themselves where they need to be to create the speed that they need. And so, um, yeah, and, and I don't think... I don't even think two years ago he had figured that out for himself. I think this is new information that he'd figured out. And obviously there's some things mechanically he's doing in his swing that are different. So uh, I think it, it's constantly evolving. But uh, it was still pretty incredible what we saw two years ago. All right, let's get into it. Uh, please share your screen with us, Dr. Lin. Uh, this, he's going to be bringing up the software for the Swing Catalyst machine. But tell us the forces that this is measuring here. So you can see we had the Foresight launch monitor collecting here. And so we got his ball speed up at 193. 
Um, and so that that information, and that's one of the cool things about our software is the launch monitor data is um, synced to all the force data. So we have it in the same file. So like, you know, this is two years ago and looking back and, you know, if you had launch monitor data in some separate file, it'd be really hard to match it up. But um, it's all in the same file so we can really see, you know, what he was doing there. Um, but most uh, ground reaction force measurement tools are pressure plates. So they only measure the pressure between the feet and the ground, yeah. which you can see is right here. Um, and so that's just kind of showing you where the, the pressures are lighting up. And interestingly enough, I never really noticed this before. He was really doing a stomp. So just, just let's go real rudimentary here. So where's the right foot? Where's the left foot? Where's front and back? This is, looks like as if you're looking down on top of the golfer. So that's his right foot here. Okay. That's his left foot. And this is the target direction that way, clearly. So yeah. those are his toes on the top and his heels on the bottom. Yeah. And so... Right before he takes the club away, he's 60-40, which is pretty standard. Um, you'll see a lot of pros have a little more pressure in their lead foot than the trail foot that kind of promotes a move off the ball. But you can see, watch as he takes the club away. This is something you don't see too often, is he's taking the club away and it's starting to move backwards, but his pressure is starting to move forwards. So he's literally kind of stomping on that left foot. So now he's 75 on his left foot. So yeah, really, the, club hasn't, the, the video synced up, right? Yeah, the club's just starting to move. You can see that it's just starting to move away. So... Um, this is interesting. This might be something they've they've found. You know, he was literally doing this stomp. You don't see people stomping their lead foot as the club's moving away. And so maybe right. this was something that led him to kind of accentuate that with that stomping kind of deal that he's doing. But so he really stomps his left foot and then stomps his right foot. And he gets pretty heavily into his right foot into 92% there. And then one of the key things is you really have to load into the ball of the foot. All these these really big hitters load right into the, the ball of their foot. You'll see a lot of amateurs that spin into their heel. It's amazing how high his hands still are when he's into the, the ball of the foot. From other stuff, I would have thought the hands would have been like down near the belt buckle by by then. Or down yeah, near the belt. No, no. Belt. So that, yeah, that's where... Um, you know, forces have to happen way before you see motions happening. Um, and this is where the timing of these things is super important. And you'll see that uh, I have his ver peak vertical force here on the bottom. And so once he really gets into the ball of that foot, now he can really push off and create that vertical force where he jumps off the ground. Oh, and yeah. you can see his, his peak vertical force is happening super early. It's about left arm parallel, um, which is um, pretty early for um, some of the, the pro data that we've seen. Um, and so, and then you can see that it, uh, it, then he literally jumps off his lead foot cause you, I mean, you saw that and, and he's still doing that where his lead foot literally leaves the ground. Um, and then obviously the pressure zooms back onto his trail foot cause you'll see like in this frame here, we don't even have a, a lead foot. It's gone like right there. Yeah. Um, so his foot is off the ground completely and you'll see the same thing. And, you know, a lot of guys that Matt Wolf does the same thing and, and that, that really makes our, our you know, center of pressure traces that a lot of people talk about, it makes them really messy because when there's the software is looking for two feet and when there isn't two feet on the ground, it kind of freaks out. And, and obviously you can see his foot now lands down here where it uh, shoots down to eventually. So you'll see his foot show up now way oh, yeah. down here on the bottom of the plate. So um, most pressure or most ground reaction force tools now, um, like if you think of body track and that kind of thing, they measure the, the pressure between the feet and the ground. Mm -hmm. um, which tells you one thing, um, it tells you a lot of information, but it's only the perpendicular forces, the forces that are um, like perpendicular to the ground that it shows you. Um, whereas our 3D motion plate here that he's standing on in this particular thing um, measures all the shear forces as well. So we can see the side to side shear forces. So those are the ones that are... So go through, go through magenta, gold and blue and what do those represent? Magenta, huh? I like it. I, I go with pink, but okay, you know, okay, that, that's all you. <laughs> um, so this is the side to side or the horizontal force. So basically, I mean, if if he would wanted to walk towards this screen up here, he would have to push off towards the camera or backwards, right? So it's kind of that force that we're pushing. It's a shear force where you're pushing side to side towards and away from the target, um, and so we call it a forward backwards force or a. a um, a horizontal force basically and so um, this is one that would create kind of a, a sway or a slide towards the target um, and so this is one that originally you know a sway or a slide used to be thought of as you know a death move in golf um, but what we're finding is this is a, a key force for a lot of people and I think this is one that I that I would say Kyle's now using more effectively with his stomping action um, mm -hmm. to, to get a little more speed 
Um, so this is basically how much he's pushing side to side. And the positive force means that he's actually, let me change this camera real quick so that we can uh, see. So if we go here, if we go here, so this is the peak of his, uh, his magenta force, as you like to say there. Um, yeah. And so at this particular point, he's Kyle's actually pushing down into the ground and away from the target and the ground's pushing him up and towards the target. So if I were to draw this on average right now, the ground is basically doing that to him. It's yeah. pushing him towards the target. And so um, you'll see a positive spike in this purple force in everybody's ground reaction forces. So there is some kind of a push away from the target, which drives you towards the target. And it's generally somewhere near the top of the backswing in most people. Um, but then obviously you can see, so now if I put a, you know, I'll put a dot here on his belt buckle, uh, close enough. So there's a dot on his belt buckle, but because we know that he's just pushed in this direction, cause the forces have to come before the motion, right? That's what Newton told us. And yeah. so because he's produced this big, uh, pink force, whatever you want to call it here, the horizontal force, we know that in the next couple frames, that belt buckle has to start moving towards the target. So if you watch here his belt buckle is going to start moving towards the target. And so you see how far it moved there. So it started here and it's moved to about there. And so yeah. that horizontal motion came from the fact that he pushed and produced this force that the ground was actually driving him towards the target. But now you'll notice that what happens to the belt buckle? Well, now that pink, pink force goes negative. Right here we have a massive negative force. So now on average, he's pushing into the ground with this lead foot and the ground, whoops, got the wrong tool here. And the ground's pushing back up on him like this. So he's, whoops, got the wrong one again. I needed this one, there we go. Perfect. There we go. So it's producing like a braking force. And this is something that these, we find these long drive guys are so good at posting up through that lead leg and um, breaking all that horizontal motion that they put in. Cause you'll see some, uh, you know, not very good golfers where that lead leg will get kind of bowed like this. Whoops, I'm not very good with that tool. <laughs> um, and you'll never see that in these in these pros, like kind of a, a rounded lead leg. And that's, whoa, that tool is hard to use. Um, yeah, we gotcha. yeah, I know yeah so that rounded lead leg is something that you'll see in a lot of amateur golfers because they're producing a lot of horizontal force, but they don't have the the, the brakes. Or they don't have the, the neuromuscular control to stop that horizontal force so their their hip gets way out ahead of their foot and the, the lead leg kind of bows on them and uh, that's something you don't see in these long drive guys they have they really have the ability to throw on the brakes of that linear force so you see how his belt buckle is basically stopped and he posts up through that lead leg and so then that that kills his horizontal force so that one's done and then he gets into rotating and, and jumping off the ground which are the next two so before we go into a uh, vertical so that's really interesting. So the, the guys who are really long and these long drive hitters, they have the ability to do almost like a, like a, 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 a burst and a break, like one, two real quickly. Yeah. And, and it's, I mean, I've seen a lot of amateurs who can get this horizontal force up in this range here. So what we've done here to give you an idea of magnitudes of forces is we put these black bands on the grass so you can see where it's got kind of a darker gray or a black kind of here, here and here. And that's the tour yeah. average. So that's from all our PGA tour data. It's the tour averages in the middle plus or minus one standard deviation. So that just gives you an idea how much force he's producing relative to PGA tour players. And I've seen a lot of amateurs that can get their horizontal force up into the, you know, the tour average or above, but not a lot of them can throw on the brakes as efficiently as he does. So, right. um, that's really one of the things that, uh, you know, you'd think, you know, it's, um, Golf is all about, you know, putting on the gas to make you swing faster, but uh, it really isn't because you got to break your body to transfer that energy to the club, and and the breaking is almost more important than the than putting on the gas. Because um, I, I would argue a lot of times in under, in uh, amateur golfers, if if they don't have the ability to turn on to put on the brakes appropriately, then most of the time I'll just turn down the gas or make sure they push a little less hard to make that that swing more efficient. Because uh, if they don't have the ability to break, you know, the the gas that they put in, then then bad things happen and they get you know, they get way past it and then the club does a lot of bad things for them. So, um, yeah, that's one of the incredible things you see in a lot of these long drive guys is, is their ability to just jam on the brakes and, and transfer that energy into another plane, which then eventually ends up on the golf club. So 
So, uh, so yeah, so now we're, a uh, term we always hear about in the golf swing is rotation. And uh, that is kind of shows, shows itself in this torque, this torque metric that you have. So in another video, you guys, I, I'll link in one of these corners uh, where I was at Dr. Scott's garage lab, where we talked about almost every great player in the world goes horizontal first, then rotational, and then vertical, which is what Kyle's, the, the, that's the order they do it. And this is, that's the order that Kyle's doing that. So check that video out. But so show us uh, when and where this uh, torque rotation. So the torque is, is a really interesting type of force. And, and it's, it's something that, I mean, I think we showed in one of those last videos, that, that kid on the ice taking his swing that shows oh, yeah. you kind of where his feet slip when he's, uh, and so basically right here in his downswing, he's producing his maximum amount of torque, which means that he's actually shoving into the ground. Let me see if I got my right tool on here. He's pushing into the ground down and backwards with his uh, trail foot. Uh -huh. So he's kind of pushing into the ground this way. And so the ground then would push back into him. Let's do red this way, up and that way. And so with his trail foot, he's producing this upward and towards the ball type force. And that's going to shove his trail hip towards the ball. And then he's doing the opposite with his lead foot. His lead foot, and you can tell that he's doing that with his lead foot. He's pushing down. Let me get the yellow back here and towards the ball with his lead foot. And the reason that you know that that's happening is where does his lead foot go right after this when he starts to jump? Does it go towards the ball? No, it jumps straight back away from it. it. Jumps yeah. straight back, right? So he's he's pushing in this direction and then the ground and pushes back on him up in this direction. And then once he gets off the ground, so once the friction of that foot is released by the vertical forces, then the ground shoves his foot back there and it lands almost off the plate over here. So um, it's pushing in those opposite directions that creates the, the rotation. And what that does is create something called a force couple. So when I teach this to my undergrads uh, in biomechanics class, I always get a water bottle out. So if I was to take the lid off a water bottle, you have to push in one direction with your finger and the opposite direction with your thumb, right? To create the twisting force to take the lid off of it. Yeah. Um, that's exactly what your feet are doing to the ground. They're pushing in opposite directions. Um, to one's pushing towards the ball, one's pushing away from the ball, and that creates the rotation of your pelvis. And and he's like way above the tour average in terms of that one, um, creating a lot of rotational forces. Um, and his and his hands are are still really high up at peak yeah. rotational force. Right. So I mean, all of these things happen have to happen before, like because. You have to create that force from the ground before you see his hips start to open up and before you see all those things start to happen. So that's one thing that you'll see um, in really good players is the timing of these things is super important and it happens way earlier than you would think. Um, and I've, I've found there's kind of an epidemic in, in amateur golfers of late forces. The force is happening too late because um, I think a lot of us have been told to kind of stay in our posture and um, and, and these are the things that uh, we're starting to learn from being able to measure these things is that... Um, speeding these things up and getting them to happen earlier in amateurs could probably help us quite a bit. Yeah, I, and I think, uh, talk a little bit, when as we're talking about torque here, um, sometimes I think when people th think of rotation uh, and they think, oh, I can get some more speed out of my swing with more rotation, more rotation, we see them just kind of spinning their hips but not really creating any forces. And uh, with Kyle Berkshire's swing here, he's definitely doing the opposite he's creating this force couple which is then creating the spinning so talk about the difference between kind of doing something that kind of has the look but none of the pressure and doing something that has the pressure and then gets the look yeah so i think that's and that's something that i always assumed would go together right if you if you had fast hips or you were really open to the target at impact um that you would have you know a lot of uh force or a torque coming from the ground um and then, but I, that assumption was proved wrong to me several times. So like a guy like Kyle, you can see here, his hips are pretty square to the target line right now. And they stay square for a long time, but he's got a ton of force coming from the ground. So they open up a little bit later. Um, and then we were measuring, uh, several years ago, I got a chance to measure this uh, Thai kid who's doing really well. Jazz, uh, I don't know if you've heard of him, J Janata Wada Wada Wada. He's like a big, long Thai name. Jaina Wadanand or something like that? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that guy. Yeah, I got a chance to measure him in our lab, and he had faster hips than Rory McIlroy. So a lot of the TPI data told us that I think it was 720 degrees per second was the fastest they've ever measured, which was Rory McIlroy. And then we got this kid in my lab, and he had faster than that. I think he was like 760 or something like that. Like his hips were like super rotational and moving really quickly. 
Um, but then we got him on the force plate and there weren't, wasn't a lot of force coming behind that. So he was kind of spinning out without anything behind it. Sorry, his hips were opening extremely fast, but, but the ground wasn't really feeling that. Yeah, well, the, the, so the, the, the force from the ground, spin. yeah, there wasn't a ton of force from the ground coming first. So I think you can't, it's possible to kind of, you know, almost jump off the ground a little bit and then spin. But, um, and that would be your, that would be your, uh, your forces out of sequence, right? Because we want to get the, the, for, the rotational force happening before the vertical force. And, and if we get that backwards and we kind of jump and then spin, then the, the, the spin is really coming from the ground is useless to us. So, um, yeah, that's something that I don't I don't fully understand, you know, how that's possible, how he could have produced all of that rotational velocity um, without having a whole lot of torque coming from the ground. But that's uh, that's something that, that we definitely need to investigate and figure out how that comes from. But but you'll never see it in really long hitters. Um, right. You'll see uh, you'll see um, you'll see that torque, a big, massive rip into the ground at this point. Um, and you can see it happens when his, when his feet or when his, his pelvis is pretty square to the target line already. So, um, and hasn't opened up much yet. I mean, and he produces tons of that. So you can see that he's well above the, the top of the tour average plus one standard deviation is basically the top of this black line and he's well above that. And so this is a ton of torque happening at the ground here. Um, it's, it's probably more than, you know, 95% of the tour, or maybe 98% of the tour, um, the amount of rotational force he's producing is is massive here. To 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 quantify that, I see you have something there, 128 pounds per foot, or what is that? What is that rotation? 130. Yeah. This one right here. Yeah. Th this is telling us that he's yeah 128. It's foot pounds of torque. Um, and so um, in our in you know the metric system we call them newton meters. So there's an amount of and so pounds is kind of a measure of force and feet is the distance basically or the moment arm of that rotational force and so i don't know if people are familiar with you know engines and and foot pounds of torque and how they produce rotational forces um it, it's a tough measure to put a you know a a, a uh, something some you can visualize on basically but um so let's say i mean so let's say you have like a wrench that's uh, a foot yeah, long uh -huh. um if you have a wrench that's like a foot long, you're producing 130 pounds of of rotational force, which is a lot. That's like a, a forward and backwards like shearing force. So it's not like you're pushing. It's not like you're using your body weight to push down. So, and and a, a, a you know foot long wrench is a really long wrench. So half a foot long wrench, he's producing you know 260 pounds worth of. So that would be like a foot long wrench if a 128 pound person like just like sat on it sat on it yeah basically yeah. i would say that that would be the amount of rotational force he's producing and wow. it's hard to visualize rotational forces but i think that's uh, yeah and if you get a half a foot long wrench like i don't know how long normal wrenches are a foot sounds like a really long wrench but um if you get a half of a half a foot long wrench then then you're you got a you know 260 pound person sitting on it and that's the amount of rotational force he's producing so um that that's that's a lot um and and that's one that's that's really hard to visualize, whereas the vertical forces are a little bit easier to visualize because they're the forces we kind of think of, of, you know, when we stand on a scale, it measures our vertical force, right? How much we're pushing straight down on that uh, on that scale. Um, and so this is one that, that he's kind of off the charts with. Yeah, let's move on to to vertical force. And if you can, can you make that the, that uh, the blue vertical force thing a little larger like you did with the pink one so, so this is the jumping move that a lot of people and when we watch the uh, world long drive championship we, we see a lot of the announcers and people t uh, talking about this jump and then uh, you see a lot of people when they're trying to kill the ball like putting this jump into their swing but uh, let's go through the data and really look at when this jump is actually happening um, well the maximal force happens here and so he's putting 239 percent of his body weight into the ground which is 520 pounds of force so wow. um, that's a heck of a lot I remember I was on one of those Facebook forums a while ago and uh, one of the golf teachers on there said you know I don't need a, a, a swing catalyst I can just lie on the ground and have my students stand on top of me and then I can feel the forces they're putting in the ground when they swing and I was like well I don't think you want to do that for these yeah. long hitters, they'd crush you, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like 520. Yeah. I mean, he was making a joke, but um, 520 pounds of vertical force is insane. Um, that's, uh, I mean, I think the the only person that I've that we've measured that had more, and and it was obviously, I'm sure Kyle can produce more than this. It was, you know, probably the indoor setting and the whole thing. But um, 
Justin James was in uh, one of our ambassador, Liam Mucklow's lab up in Canada, and he produced 300% his body weight. So that was upwards of 600 um, pounds of vertical force. So um, I, I've measured a few of these long drive people now, and they're, they're, it, I don't think it's possible to hit the ball the way that these people do or the length that these people do without using tons of this vertical force. Um, but that's something the average golfer needs to be careful of because um, – I remember when I first started measuring people on my force plate, everyone that was a bomber that hit it really far um, used a ton of this vertical force. And then um, Bernie Nager, actually, one of our ambassadors, got a chance to measure Gary Woodland's swing on this plate. Yeah. And he's one of the longest guys out there, and he basically has none of this vertical force. So he, he uses the rotational force a lot. And if you watch his swing um, you know, on video or whatever, you can see he really spins into his heel quickly. Uh, he doesn't spend a long time in the ball of his foot, which is where you have to be to jump. Um, and so you have to be really careful as an amateur golfer because, I mean, this long drive event is, it's kind of Darwinian, right? It's like level of the fittest. Like if you're yeah. able to produce all of these forces at these maximal amounts, then you might have a chance. Um, but again, I mean, you saw it a lot of times. I, for, I forget what it was, the quarterfinals I was watching with Kyle where he hit seven out of bounds and smoked the eighth one. And, right. um, and, he, and he won. Like, But imagine you go to the golf course and hit seven out of bounds and smoke one good one. You're, you're going to be a 50 handicap, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. And you're probably going to get a lawsuit. So when you see when you see people try to add vertical force into their swing or add a jump into their swing, how are they usually doing it wrong? A lot of times it happens too late. So you'll see that they, um, you know, you won't see the peak vertical force until maybe you know impact or maybe sometimes even after impact. And mm -hmm. and this is something that I think um, it's weird how um, golfers are. And I'm the same way. Like when I when I first was tested on this machine working with. Uh, on my own golf swing, working with Mike Adams, um, who he's like one of the guys who really helped me understand these forces and how we can use them in the golf swing because he has little tests to see which forces are optimal for each person. Um, and he told me that was a very horizontal player. <clears throat> so I had to produce a lot of horizontal forces in my swing to make it work. And I took that to the nth degree. Like I was swaying way off of it and swaying way past it. And I was hitting these big hooks and and I remember I went to see him afterwards. And I was like, Mike, I don't know what's going on. I'm hitting it terrible. And he's like, dude, like one aspirin's good, but the whole bottle's, you know, right. You got to be careful. And so I think, um, yeah. So like, not everyone's, you know, feet are going to leave the ground, and not everyone's going to look like Kyle Berkshire and Matt Wolf, and um, and you can still produce a lot of vertical forces without um, without your foot actually leaving the ground. Um, but the whole bottle analogy is, I think, you know, TPI has made. Uh, early extension kind of like the cardinal sin in golf um, yeah. everybody's afraid of early extension and i think a lot of us have taken the whole bottle of the being afraid of early extension and stay in our posture way too long yeah. we actually don't release our lower body because we're really afraid of early extending and and then that puts the vertical forces too late i believe so i think um there could be you know an amateur golf kind of an epidemic of late vertical forces now because you know our our uh a lot of our instruction has made early extension kind of the cardinal sin in golf. And, and I think a lot of us could, could use to go the other way now and start coming out of our postures a little earlier um, to, or, you know, getting that leg to straighten and, and post up earlier to try to get us uh, a little more of these vertical forces. But again, you got to be careful that uh, that's not for forever um, because uh, there are some people that, you know, don't need vertical forces. And our right. hypothesis is if, if you added a ton of vertical force to Gary Woodland's swing, um, it probably wouldn't equal good things. He's figured out that he needs rotation and a little bit of horizontal and very low verticals to hit it the way he does. And, um, and that's also going to affect the way the club moves into the ball. Um, because these guys, again, they're, they're not trying to curve it around trees. They're not trying to make sure they hit a fairway that's, you know, sloped from left to right or right to left or, yeah. you know, golf is way different from this event. And so I think we can learn some things from these long drive guys, but we have to be careful that we don't take it too far because, uh, then people who live on golf courses and people who park along the side of yeah. <laughs> golf are going to be not too happy with us. So Kyle, when you measured him, probably after warm up and everything else was probably around 205 or something like that, which is what most of the long drive, a lot of the long drive guys were at uh, this year's competition. 
But he's added this move uh, that we'll just go through a little bit, and then uh, and then I'd like to hear your opinion on on why he does this move and why you think it might have added some um, ball speed for him. Okay, so like the club hasn't even moved yet, right? And so he's kind of setting up to it. He lifts that front foot, um, so that's you know, obviously he's 100% into his trail foot there, and then he stomps the front foot and lifts his trail foot, and so now he's 100% into his lead foot. And then the second that trail foot hits the ground, he takes the club away. And so to me, that that stomping is a pre-trigger for some horizontal motion or some horizontal force, right? So he's trying to create that side-to-side -side force, that swaying force, basically. Um, and to me, that was from the 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 videos or from the the forces that we saw from him two years ago. Um, that was the only one of his three forces that weren't like off the charts in terms of their magnitudes relative to tour average. And so um, if I had to guess, you know, which one would be, you know, his weakest of the three power sources, it would be the horizontal force two years ago. Um, and I'm not sure if I'd have to talk to his coach, Bernie, there, whether that was something they identified and decided, OK, we need to ramp this one up if we're going to get some some more uh, speed in this swing. Um, but uh, that's one thing that we find, like it's rare in PGA Tour golfers that you'll find somebody who has all three of those forces kind of within the tour average or above. Um, but in these long drive guys, I don't think it's possible to compete if you don't have all three forces um, in the tour average or above. So um, you have to have all three of them. I mean, in, in PGA Tour players, we call it the rare trifecta, somebody who has all three of those forces maxed out. Um, and we've only seen it in four or five PGA Tour players out of those, uh, you know, 50 or 60 that we've measured. Um, but in the long drive guys, I don't think it's possible to compete in this and to get those speeds without it. So two years ago, that was the one that was lacking. And this seems to be a move to try to increase that side to side force, um, which is one that, uh, you know, and I don't know if he, if he, that looks like a draw to me, but generally with more side, to side we hit a cut on that one. The, yeah, I think there are two. This is the magic eight ball one, which was a draw. Yeah. And then, and then this one, uh, I think was the, the winning shot. Here, which uh, faded. That, that was a fade, yeah. I mean, that thing's just going so fast. <laughs> I don't think these guys have a, you know, do you think ever they're thinking about a draw or a fade up there when they're trying to? Doubt, yeah, they are. Some of them are. But I've, yeah, I've, I've, I've interviewed them. Yeah, no, they are. Like, they, they have a shot. They have a shot they like. <laughs> but, you know, like, if it's a degree off, it's just, it's gone. You know, it's way, <laughs> it's way off the map. Uh, and then, all right, so let's talk a little bit about. So then obviously, like I'm sure a lot of people did, we have this guy, me. Nice. Now, I'm, do I'm doing the same kind of thing here, <laughs> my version of it. And somebody told me, uh, so you can see like just off the bat, I mean, he's actually got his foot when he does it. Way up. Uh, let's see. That's like 10 inches or so above the ground. Yeah. And then, and then the, the back one, actually see how it comes in a little too. gets yeah. a little narrower. So yeah, when I did it, actually, I was surprised. I I, uh, I hit it pretty good this way. And where did it go? Did it? It went dead straight. Yeah, it went dead straight. So yeah, like that's what I was saying. Like I hit it pretty solid this way. But uh, I'd have to get on the force plate and see. I know for sure that all my stuff happens. Like all those graphs that Kyle has, you can shift them all to the right. Like they're all happening too late. So this, the, the, I think one of the things that this did for me is it just got my backswing faster and a little bit more athletic, and then that got everything else faster. Yeah, sure, and, and if it did introduce some horizontal forces into you, um, I mean, what we found with some of the work we did with Ping was that uh, people with high horizontal forces tended to, pr to produce a more inside-out path. Um, and so I don't know if you, what, your, what your struggle is path-wise, but um, if your struggle is kind of a left path, then that could you know, help you straighten it out a little bit by introducing some more of these horizontal forces. Um, but again, the problem with human beings is that same move in two different people could produce two completely different results. And oh, so yeah. that's why that's why we need to measure things because, um, you know, in Kyle, it might help him produce a little more horizontal force. And, and but in somebody else, you know, it could produce completely different results. So um, human beings are messy. They they do different things all the time based on, you know, a million different factors. So you have to be careful uh, of making assumptions based on videos or or whatever it is that you're that you're looking at. And that's why the technology it takes the guesswork out of it okay guys thanks a lot for watching if you have any specific questions for dr scott we're going to make this really easy just put them in the comments below and uh, i'll have dr scott visit the page and uh, or you can send him a direct email 
which is, what, what's your email? Uh, slin at swingcatalyst.com. But uh, fill up the comments below because that, that, um, that will get directly to him. I think the main point to, to recap uh, a little bit, guys, because I always want to, like, it's Be Better Golf, so I always want be, people to have, like, actionable information on this. I think what I really liked hearing was that, you know, things, uh, forces have to happen first before motion happens. Um, the other thing I heard somebody else talk about is because we hear a lot of golf teachers talk about um, wanting people to do things, but it doesn't really show up. We're starting to get more and more tools in our uh, arsenal, science-wise, to see like some of these forces that teachers have been talking about for 200 years, now we're actually able to see it, you know? Yeah. So I think that's really cool. A lot of things from you, right? And I think you posted some things recently about the angle the video camera needs to be at. I think a lot of people are making decisions about what to do with people's swings based on pre and post and maybe the camera's in a slightly different position which can really you know in yeah. a 2d video there's a lot of things that you can misinterpret based on um, positioning of cameras and a whole bunch of different factors so that's why you know looking at the forces that go into producing those motions can help us uh, hopefully make a little bit more informed decisions about you know what to do with our swings and the other thing i really like that you said was that uh, uh people being um i know that people because of the uh maybe social media, but definitely because of like, you know, the access to video cameras, there, a lot of people are chasing certain looks or not really even chasing certain looks, but they're more ch uh, running away from certain looks. Because yeah. that's like, you know, it's incredibly embarrassing for, for you to like, to be somebody with early extension and like, you've never gotten over it, you know? And uh, uh, so I know a lot, I think a lot of people are, um, Say, because I'll I'll hear this sometimes when I'm when I'm uh, at one of the Be Better Golf schools or something else like that, where you'll tell somebody to do something like, hey, I want I want you to like to try this and say, oh, if I do that, I'm gonna I'm gonna do I'm gonna early extend, or if I do that, I'm gonna be over the top. Well, it's like, well, let's just try it. Let yeah. you know, being better at golf be your your guide rather than like you know, then uh, how how you look. Yeah. Exactly, and I think any of those faults like over the top or or you know, early extension, you could probably find. 50 people who've made their living playing this game and ton, won tons of money who do those things. And so for some people that works or some people that's what we need to do to make that body hit the ball the best it possibly can. So yeah, I think Mike Adams says, our goal in golf is not to please the one-eyed monster, right? The video camera. Yeah. Um, our goal in golf is to make that little white thing or yellow thing or whatever the is you're hitting. Uh, yeah. Do what you want it to do and go where you need it to go. And so um, yeah, pleasing the one-eyed monster is not going to yeah, there is no uh, awards in golf for prettiness uh, of golf swings. Dr. Scott works with Swing Catalyst, and I think uh, a while ago they did organize some kind of perk for being a Be Better Golfer if you are a golf instructor that wants to get one of these amazing machines. It's way beyond, and I've used it, it's way beyond just knowing, way beyond the video camera, obviously, but then also way beyond just knowing where the pressure is. Seeing where, uh, for me, the main thing was, because I didn't have very much of that sheer force, that was a very big thing for me. And uh, they're continuing to come out with some really great supplemental material on, okay, you're doing this, now here's a correction, things like that. I'm gonna, if you're interested in that, just send me an email, contact bebettergolf at gmail.com, and I will give uh, uh, you a special code if you would like this in your uh, studio or at your golf course, or even the, the, there's people who have these at their homes. Awesome. Yeah. So we, yeah, we can connect you with somebody who has one or if you, uh, if you're interested in getting one, yeah, we can definitely put you in touch with the people who, uh, who do the sales, which is not me, but we'll get you in touch with those people. And, uh, and yeah, we've arranged a little deal for the people who find out about it through your, through your, uh, YouTube channel. Um, yeah. and they'll get some money off and, and it'll be all good. Thanks for watching everybody. Click the subscribe button. See you later. Bye.